Hey everybody, uh, welcome to today's lesson. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about super saturated solutions, which are going to be super rare, um, as well as precipitation. And I thought we could start today's class off with talking about one of my favorite candies, which is rock candy, and the process of how that's made. So there are some questions on your notes sheets that we're going to be looking for, so just quickly to review those questions before we jump into the video. Before being heated, is the solution of sugar and water dissolved? Why do they heat the sugar water solution? When the solution has reached boiling, is the solution completely dissolved? And as the solution cooled, what began to happen? So let's go ahead and take a look at making rock candy. Rock candy is made from crystallized sugar. Crystallization is the process of forming a solid crystalline precipitate from a solution or melted substance. The equipment and ingredients you're gonna need for this episode includes a whole lot of sugar, a pot, a tall glass, a clip or clothespin wide enough to cover the top of the glass, wood skewers or popsicle sticks, and optionally, flavoring. The safety equipment you're going to need for this experiment include goggles, thermal gloves, and an apron or lab coat to protect from spills and splashes. Also, because the sugar solution is extremely hot, adult supervision is required. The first step in our experiment is to make a sugar solution to put on the stove. Add one cup of water to your pot then three cups of sugar. I told you guys, you can dissolve Mix so much sugar. Until they're thoroughly mixed. Next, take one of your skewers and dip it in some water and then roll it in sugar. This will create the seed crystals for a rock candy. Once it's coated, set it aside until it's dry. While you wait for your sticks to dry, place the pot that contains the solution onto the stove and turn the now stove notice, up to high. Is Continue that dissolved to, to start with? Once your solution begins to boil, stir it rapidly until all the sugar has been mixed into the solution. Once all your sugar is mixed in, this is a great time to add any flavoring or coloring. Once you're done mixing in all your sugar, colors, and flavors, remove from the burner. The next step in our experiment is to take your boiling solution and pour it into the glass in which you're gonna grow your crystals. Let the solution cool for 10 minutes, and then place the sugar-coated stick into the middle of the glass and hold it in place with a clip. Leave your solution in a warm, dry place to cool. As it cools, crystals will begin to grow on the stick. The process of growing these crystals can take a couple of days up to a couple of weeks. Check your crystals daily and make sure that the crystals growing on the stick don't come in contact with any crystals growing on the sides or bottom of the glass. If you notice they're growing close together, reposition the stick so it's further away from other crystals. Once your crystals are done growing, use a knife to crack the top shell of your solution. Gently remove your crystals from the solution and hang them in a new glass using the clip to hold it in place to drip and dry. Once your crystals have finished dripping and drying, you'll have a delicious crystalline sugary snack. During All right, so making rock candy is super easy. You should definitely try it at home if you're interested. As long as you have enough sugar, it does take quite a bit of sugar, uh, but I recommend it if you are interested. So let's go ahead and take a look at our notes. So before being heated, was the sugar solution of sugar and water fully dissolved? So we had one cup of sugar, I'm sorry, one cup of water, three cups of sugar, and no, it was not completely dissolved. Okay. Why did they have to heat the sugar and water solution then? What was the purpose of heating the sugar water solution? Well, we had to make sure to heat it so that we could get all of that sugar to, to dissolve. Okay. So we wanted to get all of the sugar to dissolve. To dissolve all sugar. Okay, when the solution reached its boiling point, was the sugar, uh, is the solution completely dissolved? If you listened carefully, he did state that yes, okay, we, we will heat it until it's completely dissolved. So yes, okay, the solution was homogenous, okay, when they were boiling it. And then lastly, as the solution cooled, in that time lapse video, you saw that as the solution cooled, what began to happen? Okay, we saw that those sugar crystals formed on our stick, okay? So the uh, sugar crystals formed on our stick or on the stick. And so what we're gonna be kind of looking at today or what our focus for today's lesson is, why did that sugar crystallize? Why did those crystals form? Why did the crystals form? All right, excellent. So 
Let's go ahead. I want to show you guys a quick simulation here. Um, these are hyperlinked, so you should be able to also play around with it if you would like. Um, so feel free. Uh, but I want to go ahead and take a look at the simulation where we're adding salt to water. Now, this is different than the simulation we saw yesterday. For this one, you can actually see the crystals um, in the water and what happens as they break apart. So we're going to be looking for three questions. So as the salt is added, what happens? How are we able to uh, tell when the solution was saturated? And then observe the solid at the bottom of the beaker and describe what is happening. So here we have our uh, shaker and uh, salt. So I'm gonna go ahead and start adding that to solution. Okay, and you'll notice that as we add it, we can actually see that salt dissolve. The solid becomes part of the aqueous solution. Okay, so we're going to keep adding it, and I want to know how do we know when we've reached a saturated solution? How do we know that the solution can no longer dissolve any more salt? Okay, and it looks like it's still dissolving, so let's add a little bit more. See if we can reach that point of saturation. Okay, sorry, this is like laggy on my end, so it's hard for me to sh shake that salt shaker any faster. But it looks like we've reached our point of saturation. And we've talked about this already, but how do we know when a solution is saturated, right? And the answer is, well, if we take a look at the bottom of our beaker, right, we should uh, we should see that there is a solid at the bottom of the beaker. And this is actually really hard to see on this, um, on this screen. I was hoping to get it to zoom in, but I, I really can't for some reason do that here. Um, oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so what I want to point out here, that actually made it even smaller. Okay. It happens. Technological difficulties. Um, so let me go ahead and try to minimize it so it's normal sized again. I don't know. I don't know what I did to it. I screwed it all up. Um, but if we look very closely at the bottom of the beaker, we should be able to see that um, the salt crystals, okay, are, let me just, there we go. Let's see if I can get this to at least be somewhat visible here. Um, I can't, it's, it's so, it's so messed up now. I don't know what I did. Uh, but what we should be able to see is that the, the crystals are not staying stagnant on the solid that's sitting at the bottom. The little ions are not staying stagnant. Um, and what we'll notice is that some of them are breaking off and then some of them are forming on. And so if we were to watch this for long enough, the shape of our molecule or the shape of our solid at the bottom is actually going to shift and change. And I highly recommend, since this is clearly causing issues on my computer to zoom in, I recommend trying it on your own just so you can see that happening. Um, and this is, this is what happens when we've reached a saturated solution. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that means, why we're seeing that shape change, and why we see some pieces break off, but some form on. All right. So as the salt was added during the simulation, what happened to that, uh, to that salt? So we saw the salt dissolve. And when we say dissolve, what we're re really looking at is the salt is being uh, ionized, right? It's breaking apart into its ions, into its mobile ions, okay? And then how are we able to tell that the solution was saturated? Again, we saw that the uh, solid was forming at the bottom, right? And we had the maximum dissolved. And again, this is the part, question three, that I'd love for you guys to try on your own if you, if you can. Um, is to pull up that simulation and really observe that happening at the bottom. Um, but what's occurring? So the solid at the bottom is changing shape. And the reason that it was changing shape is ions break off solid 
as more ions attach to the solid. Okay, and so what we're actually seeing here is this really cool process, um, and it's called equilibrium. And we're going to talk a lot about equilibrium this year. It's going to come up in a couple of different places. But I, the idea here is that the rate that the solid is dissolving at the bottom is equal to the rate of crystallization or the formation of the solid. So we're seeing both processes occurring simultaneously and at the same rate. So let's go ahead and make note of this. Okay, the rate of dissolving is equal to the rate of crystallization. Okay, and this is only going to be true for saturated solutions. And so we're all pretty familiar with what is dissolving. And she did, uh, the nice lady from the video from Psy Guys, I can't, I can't remember her name. Um, she did describe what crystallization means as well, but let's get that definition on the sheet. And crystallization is the process of forming a crystal precipitate from a solution. Okay, essentially what we're gonna see is that the ions are forming, and you can actually see that in this diagram that's provided for you here, we have ions leaving, and for every ion that leaves, we have ions that are joining. So it happens at an equal rate. For every ion that leaves, a new ion crystallizes on. All right, so as temperature increases, okay, we saw this in the video, we've talked about this the last couple of days, as our temperature increases, solubility increases. So what happens then, we took that boiling water solution of sugar and water, or they did in the video, and they let it cool down. As we decrease the temperature of the solution, um, what happens to the solubility then? So take a minute, pause, and really think about that. What happens to that solubility? Well, as temperature increases, solubility increases. So as temperature decreases, okay, solubility decreases. Okay, so as the solubility of our solution is decreasing then, what's gonna happen? Well, our point of saturation changes. So at 100 degrees, I can hold a lot more dissolved solute than at 20 degrees. And so what's gonna happen to all of that once dissolved substance as we cool it down? Well, as we saw in the video, we formed these crystals, right? Those really beautiful rock candy crystals. And so as we cool solutions down, we see that the once dissolved solid is going to precipitate out, okay? Um, and so as the solubility decreases, the solute, will precipitate out of solution and crystallize, okay? So there is, I, uh, I, would, I, us I usually make my students generate their own procedure, how to do this, how to determine the amount of solute that will precipitate, but in the interest of time, and since we are doing a flipped classroom this year, let's go ahead and just go through a procedure of how to figure that out. So there will be region-based questions that will ask you how much of this solid crystallizes out or precipitates out as it is cooled from 80 degrees to 60 degrees. So three-step procedure here. Step one, find the number of grams dissolved at the hotter temp. And again, this is going to be that point of saturation. Okay. After you found the grams at the hotter temperature, you're going to find the number of grams dissolved at the cooler temperature. And again, that is also still a point of saturation. So you're gonna follow that line of saturation on your solubility curve from hot to cool. And then 
Last step, you're going to subtract the hot minus the cold. Um, to, to find the grams of precipitate or the amount of grams that crystallize out of solution. So that's going to be our process to find the amount of grams that precipitate. Now, here's the thing, right? We called this lesson precipitation and supersaturated. And I know in class today, a lot of you guys were really excited about this concept of supersaturation. But I do want to go ahead and quickly just touch base on that supersaturation here. Supersaturated solutions are pretty rare. Um, they're actually very challenging to make, and not every solute can create a supersaturated solution. Um, there are specific solutes that will make them, but for example, if you were going to try to create a supersaturated solution with like sugar or salt, table salt, it's going to be really hard to do so. So as I mentioned, supersaturated solutions are rare. So how do I know in a given problem if I'm talking about a supersaturated solution or a saturated solution which has the, the precipitate or the, um, the excess at the bottom, right? That, that solid just sitting at the bottom. How do I know the difference? Here's how we know. Suppose I have an 80 gram sample of NaCl that has been completely dissolved in 100 grams of water at 40 degrees. How would this solution be classified? Now, I want to point out here that if you look at the curve of uh, if you look at the curve of NaCl at 40 degrees in 100 grams of water, this, the point of saturation is about 38 grams. Okay. However, in this problem, it tells us that we've dissolved 80 grams and key words, again, completely dissolved, okay? When you see that term completely dissolved, those are the key words here to indicate super saturated. You have to see those terms completely dissolved and be above the point of saturation in order to be super saturated. So this would be super saturated. Okay, again, I, I tell you those buzzwords have to be there. So a super saturated solution is a solution that contains more than the maximum amount of solute per given amount of solvent at a given temperature. So why does adding solute to an already saturated solution not automatically make it super saturated. So we saw an example in class today in a multiple choice question where it said 45 grams of solute, right, were dissolved into this. Is this classified as homogeneous or heterogeneous and saturated or unsaturated? So just because you have a solution that's reached its point of saturation and you continue to add solute does not mean that it's going to be a uh, a super saturated solution. And you can see that from this image that I've included here, right? This beaker right here, it doesn't always dissolve, right? We can't, um, we can't just create super saturated solutions. So it doesn't always dissolve. Again, in order for it to be super saturated, it has to be completely dissolved. So of these two beakers that I've provided here, how do we know which is super saturated? Well, I'm if I'm telling you that one of them is super saturated, that means that the one that has the completely dissolved solutes is super saturated. Okay, so this one is completely dissolved and therefore it is super saturated. All right, everybody, I can't even see my time, how much time I've taken recording. I'm really sorry about that, um, but I'm sorry if it's long, and uh, I hope you guys have a great day, and I will see you guys in class tomorrow.